We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're working through the doctrine of separation. It's a, it's a concept in Scripture, a doctrine in Scripture that actually is not emphasized today. Matter of fact, if you preach on any concepts like this, you immediately get labeled as legalistic and uh, those kinds of things and hate-filled and not being gracious and all that. Do we believe that we should have the whole counsel of God? So uh, should there be passages that we ignore? Yeah, and, and I'm just saying that this passage we've come through through walking through 2 Corinthians, I believe it's got what God has for us to hear this morning, but I want to, in, our, in prayer, and I'll pray this way, I want to reflect the Word of God well, but it's up to you to see what it says there, examine it by the Word of God yourself, and live according there too. But the doctrine of separation is bound in this concept of holiness. And just before I pray, I want to remind you that the foreign, the nature of preaching about holiness is not necessarily foreign to the church today. Uh, There are many churches that will preach about the character of God and His holiness. But the application of that holiness is something that has gone silent in many churches. And my job today is not to point out other churches or to say that we're, we're the only one doing it right. We're not. But this passage does speak to individual, personal holiness. And we want to own that as children of God, people that love him and walk with him. For those that may not be saved, when you come to this message today and hear this concept, I want to remind everybody that we don't come to Christ through rules and regulations. Christ is the one who fulfilled the law. He went to the cross to pay all of man's sin's debt. And all of us need all of our sins paid for, do we not? All of us need to be forgiven. All of us need God's grace. But once you come to know Christ, he has put you into the body of Christ. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he's made us something. What has he made us? A new new creation, a new creature. We're new in Jesus. We're not the same as we were. (coughs) Excuse me. And that is a work of God in the believer's life. I want you to have confidence that God is at work in your life. He's going to use his spirit. He's going to use his word to work about in you a life that looks like Jesus. And this is really not about rules. It's about a loving relationship with the Savior who died for you, rose again, washes all your sin away if you come to him in faith, and promises you something that you cannot comprehend and something that I cannot comprehend. Eternity in heaven where there is no more pain, sorrow, sickness, death, suffering. And folks, he's coming again and it won't be long. But this message is a message that he has for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we ended with verses um, 14 and moving forward. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, we really built off of verse 14 and moving forward. And I'm going to go back and read verse 14 through chapter 17 and verse 1. In this passage, it says, verse 14, matter of fact, you've got your Bibles there. I always like it when we read together. So let's read from chapter, four, chapter 6, verse 14, through chapter 7, verse 1, reading out loud together with me. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Are you thankful for a God that saves you? Are you? Okay, so I'm going to argue from a position of gratitude that compels the believer to live a life consecrated to Christ. So I'm going to say, how can we truly appreciate and comprehend the debt that's paid to wash away the sins of all that will come to Christ? How can we fully comprehend and understand that? And how can we fully comprehend and understand 
the grace that's given to us that for all of eternity future, we're beneficiaries of the mercy and grace of God in this concept eternally. It's hard to imagine these things. It's hard to imagine even a glorified body, isn't it? Isn't it hard to, to somehow conceptualize a body that is not stained with sin? And yet God promised these things to his children. And he also says in his word that he, it is his desire in the ages to come to show his goodness to his children. So I, I'm going to say again, heaven is better than you know. Heaven is better than I know. But out of what God has done for us, God also gives us a doctrine that we should know. And the doctrine that we should know is that God has separated unto himself his children. The doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of holiness, often in the Greek in the Bible is called agios, is the word that you're going to use. It does mean holy. We're going to look at several of these passages. But God separates unto himself his children that he calls his own. He makes a distinction from everybody else in the Old Testament. That was good to see. Were the Jews different from the nations around them? Well, they were not only different because they worship a different God, the true God, but God had set up in their economy of life, in their way of life, a lot of different rules and standards that separated them from everyone else. And everyone can argue over why did God have that law or this law or that thing. We might come in and justify why God made those various laws. The truth is God doesn't need any justification, but... In those things, we know this one thing is true. He did what he did to separate his children from everyone else, to call them his own, and to, even in that invitation, know that he would, through his people, offer that relationship to what we would know as the Gentile world, that would come through the seed of Abraham, that a Savior would be given. But that invitation has been given for everyone to come into the family of Christ, now, you know this passage, John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, you know the verse? To them gave he power, and the word power there means the authority or the right to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So who has the authority or right to be called the son of God? Those who've come to Jesus. So the invitation this morning really is for everybody in this room or on video, the sound of this voice hearing, under the sound of this voice hearing, that God offers everyone to come into that relationship with Christ. Everyone. So if you're here today and not saved, here today and don't know for sure you're going to heaven, do not believe the lie of the devil. Do not believe your own carnal thinking that you're just too bad to be redeemed. None of us deserve to be redeemed. None of us deserve to go to heaven. It's God's grace that anyone is saved. And that invitation is open to everyone today. But when you become a child of God, when that happens, you are eternally a child of God. Something that cannot be taken from his children. And in that, God begins a work in you. It's actually something that you should know. There are two concepts we're going to be talking about today. Largely, we're going to be talking about practical sanctification or holiness. But there is positional sanctification and holiness as well. Positionally, when you come to know Christ, you are already declared to be completely holy. Read Romans 8. I'm not going to take time to go there. But read Romans 8 and you'll see that God sees you as his child already glorified. Already in heaven. Already cleansed. Every bit of it. Already done. Why? Because of the sufficiency of Christ. What Christ did was sufficient to pay man's debt and to allow you to be in heaven because he is a resurrected Savior. So that being known, God has positionally placed you in the, in the body, positionally placed you in the family, and positionally declares you to be completely sanctified and holy. However, there is progressive or pra practical sanctification, holiness, which I'm going to use together. And it is the idea where God is continually at work in his children, growing them in holiness. Growing in their maturity, which if we were to look at what that means, I'm just going to mark it for a second. I'm not really going to go there. You can write it in your notes or look at it later. But Ephesians chapter 4, folks, we go to this passage often. Who's the target for the believer? What's the goal for the believer? To be like who? Like Jesus. Amen? He's the goal. He's the target. He's the one we want to be connected to. The Lord says in John 14, abide in him, keep walking in Christ. Amen? So he's the goal, right? I hope, I hope in coming to fellowship this morning, you recognize that we're lifting up Jesus. 
And we're glad to do so. Amen? We're glad to know and identify that all of our hope is in him. But in this passage, we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, a few things that we have to go over again. And really, it's in verses 17 forward. It says, wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Be separate from whom? All the six things that he just listed in the previous verses. The distinction between the saved and the lost. The distinction between those who know Christ and those who don't. Again, how is that different? It's because God made that difference in you when you came to him in, in, in faith through Christ. But it says, come and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And it goes on to say, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, I, I want to just help with this for a moment. Some would argue then, what is the unclean thing? Do you see something beside your King James Version if you have that this morning? Do you notice anything about the word thing? Do you? Look at it. What's different about it? It's in italics. Okay, for many of you that have a King James, you're going to see that in italics. Why is that there? It's added by the translators to help with understanding. In this particular uh, passage, that idea should be understood, not just as a particular thing, but the idea of the passage is that which is unclean. It's the broad scope. In other words, in this passage, is not a single thing. It's not like touch that, that one unclean thing. And by the way, if that one unclean thing was there, the Lord would have declared that to be so. But there is not one unclean thing. The idea is whatever that is. Now, I want to help here, and I hope. Uh, first of all, can you smile back at me? It makes me feel happier, like, like you're with me maybe. Uh, do the Joel Osteen, okay, that'll help a little bit. Okay, so this, this doctrine, and when it says touch not the unclean or the unclean thing, bears to the life of the believer to have an application. Amen? Amen. Now, here's why I say that. There are a lot of different concepts. This is not the only passage that talks about holiness. But holiness, is it fair to say that when we talk about holiness, that God has separated us from the economy, meaning the lifestyle, behavior, motivation, focus of life, has God separated us from the world? Okay, I'm going to ask it in because I'm not sure you're there. Has God separated us from the world? Now, I'm not trying, let me tell you what this is like preaching. Appreciate this. This is, this is the softball. If you can't hit a home run on this, then we need to get into our Bibles and study the Bible, right? So this is the softball pitch. This is, this is not spiritual rocket science. God has separated his children from the world. Now, we're in the world, but we are not. There you go. Hey, you're with me. That's exciting. <laughs> now, what does that mean? So here's the danger. And I'm, believe me, I'm going to get in the passage. But here's the danger. We live in a postmodern era. And there is a postmodern influence in Christianity. And that postmodern influence in Christianity that has been really permeating into Christianity from the world is this unwillingness to declare right and wrongs, and an unwillingness to take a position in your own life on what you believe is right or you believe is wrong. And the idea is it's right to you as long as you think it's right for you. It's right for you as long as it makes you, everybody should know the answer to that. It's right for you as long as it makes you do people get the idea of what happiness is wrong? So I, I, I saw this the other day. A guy was asked a question, would you rather be wealthy and unhappy or poor and happy? And you might already know, but he chose wealthy and unhappy. Why did he choose wealthy and unhappy? Why did he choose that? Because he doesn't get it. He thinks without understanding, using his brain that God gave him, 
that if the option is to be wealthy and unhappy as opposed to being poor and happy, that somehow anyway, getting money is finally going to make me happy. And the world has proven that to be true, right? If you got money, you're going to be happy. Wrong. Now, I think there's, uh, the message isn't intended to go this way. It does not mean that if you have money and you are wealthy, by the way, everybody in the United States can argue that we are wealthy. Everybody can. And if there's any country on the planet that (laughs) is trying to still yet find happiness, you look here. And you look at the crazy that we are. God separates us from the world, but in postmodern Christianity, here's how that works. And I'm talking about religious leaders, okay? People that are presidents of colleges, religious institutions, say things like this. We can't really even identify what the world is. And here's my point. If these passages are in the Bible They are not in the Bible simply for us to read and move on without any personal application to our lives. It is up to the individual believer to examine the character of God, the lifestyle of our own uh, living and behavior, and examine, does my life look like Jesus? Does the behavior, the manifestation of my character and choices, do those things look like Jesus. The problem is, is that many times we'll get a preacher in front of us and says, you want to look like Jesus, here's my list of a hundred things. You do my list and you'll be like Jesus. And, and we would rather not take that kind of counsel. We would rather take the counsel of live by the word of God, walk in the spirit, and God will make you holy. It's that simple. And, but guess what? He's already given you his spirit. He's already given you his word. But now it's up to us to examine it and to see how does this live in my life? Remember, your standard is not the world around you. And I will say, your standard is not what the world around you thinks about Christianity. It's your walk with God. But here's the, here's the desire of this. The desire of this is to look into the life and say, Well, what are those things that would be unclean? Those things that I think that God would want me to separate from because they are not spiritually healthy for me and spiritually healthy for others. Therefore, I'm going to apply this passage amongst others and I'm going to separate myself from things that may be lawful but are not, do you know the next word, but are not, do you know the word, expedient. They are not helpful. So because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And because other believers are doing something doesn't mean you should. Have believers ever led other believers astray? Yeah. (laughs) Right? So who do we need? We need the Lord. So this passage says, in your life, you are going to be careful about touching the unclean in your life, about bringing it into your life. The the idea beyond this is that this will then reflect that relationship that you see in verse 18. This will reflect that God is your father, that you are his child, that there are things that you do and don't do in the world, but not because you're better, Not because you're more holy than or a holier than thou person, but because you simply love the Lord. And because of that, you screen your life by the character of Christ. You screen your life by the Word of God. Now, let me go ahead and say something here before I get into chapter 7. In chapter 7, we're going to read this verse about perfecting holiness, but I think it's important here to come back to some distinctives about fellowship. Now, I don't know how people are going to describe fellowship, but sometimes people describe fellowship as a conservative church. I'm going to take a moment here, and I'm going to argue why every church and every religious institution and really why every believer should be conservative. But I have to make a distinction. I'm not talking politics. 
There are often three things that I use to describe the church, and I often say, my wife doesn't really like my three things because they're a little bit redundant. But I describe our church often as cautious, careful, and conservative. And those first two words are very similar. Cautious, careful, and conservative. Why? Why? And I will tell people we are not cautious, careful, and conservative simply by preference. We are doctrinally led to this position. So that invades, this doctrine invades and permeates the character of this church because we believe we're supposed to be a church who is following the head, Jesus. And until we get to heaven, there are going to be some things that we're not going to be able to sort out. You know what we're all going to find out in heaven? Do you know what we're going to find out in heaven? I would not be surprised when we're in heaven that there is not one man wearing a tie, bless God. I'm, I'm sorry, but some of you, some of you, you know what? I'll bet you, I'll just bet you, there are no three-piece suits. I think a lot of us are going to go get in heaven and we're going to go, what? Until we get there, though, You and I have to be concerned about not letting the stain of our sin, the stain of the world, lead us away from looking like Jesus. I'm just with you. I'm a brother talking with you about this doctrine that has impacted my life. And I want to tell you, I'm not the standard. Now, come on. That's, that's a little offensive. <laughs> but when I said that, some of you kind of quietly went, phew, <laughs> good. <laughs> the standard's Jesus. The standard's Jesus. The standard's Jesus. Every time Jesus. Every time Jesus. Every time Jesus. So I had a friend of mine one time ask me, do you really ask Jesus about everything in your life? I I think I'd be lying if I said yes, but I'll tell you that's the heart compass, that's the goal, and I I think because of the grace of God, but I want to run what I do by Jesus. And it doesn't make me right or perfect on everything, it certainly doesn't, and until we get to heaven, we might argue over, well, should you do that, should you not do that, but the goal isn't each other. The goal is a heart attitude that wants to follow Christ. He's got to be the standard. He's got to be the one. By the way, we say this about people getting married. You don't want somebody who just thinks you're good looking or somebody that thinks, oh, you're sweet or somebody that thinks, oh, they're a nice person. You you want somebody who loves God. It's loving God that's going to make somebody a good husband. It's loving God that's going to make somebody a good wife. It's loving God that's going to make someone do right. If you won't do right for God, you won't do right for a spouse. I'm not sure you should have said amen to that. I don't know. We'll think about it. But here's the idea. Having therefore these promises, the promises really are that we are separated unto God by the reconciliation message of Christ. That's the overarching theme that we've come to into chapter 7 and verse 1. We're separated unto Christ through reconciliation. That's the theme. But in that theme, having therefore these promises... What does he say next? Dearly beloved. He he argues, I love God's people. And sometimes I think that these are perceived as saying hard things. But but as a brother here, I want to tell you that I'm just going to be honest. These should not be hard things. Why do we have to argue that selling out for Christ is a good thing. Do we really want to take a position opposite of that? Is that really where we would land, that God somehow is not going to be good to you if you sell out for him and live a holy life? That God's going to take some good thing away from you? Is that really what, what we want to argue towards? If we do, we've got bad doctrine. 
Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, here's, here's the idea again. You're going to hear it again. Let us cleanse ourselves. Touch not the unclean thing in chapter 6, but let us cleanse ourselves from what? All what? Filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Who does this for you? I'm going to tell you again, folks, if any of us have a marker of what other people are saying, those standards are going to fail you because they do not have the motivating power to cause you to do what's right. If you don't do right because of Christ, you'll never do right. It just not, does not have staying power. It has to be about Jesus. It has to be about him. So he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And then it gives this statement, perfecting holiness, what? So what does it mean to, to fear God? Well, let's come to that secondly. But let's talk about perfecting holiness. I touched base on this with the, you guys remember I got done before 12 last week? <laughs> yeah, don't get used to it. Um, but I touched on this perfecting holiness. What does perfecting mean? It means to bring to a completion, to bring to an end. It means to accomplish something. It's that idea that oh, made it. Now, I know, and it's true, that this is not truly going to ever be accomplished in this world until we finally are in the presence of Christ. Nonetheless, this is what we're striving after. We want to look like Jesus. So I mentioned the cautious, careful, and conservative nature of our church. A lot of the standards that we have here are arguable. And we, we would admit, we struggle over where do you find that verse in the Bible? And where do you find that manifestation of that kind of thing in the Bible? And really, there's a humble seeking look. Sometimes we don't know exactly how that lives. But I will tell you, this is the nature that every believer ought to have. But the Bible teaches very simply in Galatians 5.16, this I say, then walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The idea of the believer is just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit every day of your life. Every moment of your life and listening to him and desiring him and wanting to walk with him so that when he speaks to your heart, he guides you into things and he guides you away from things, not because of rules, but because he loves you. Do you want God leading your life? I hope so. You look to mankind and man is, I, again, my phrase, messed up six ways from Sunday. We want God. We want Christ to be our director. But it is now given positionally, practically, to you to work in coordination with the Spirit and the Word of God to perfect holiness in your life. To live and accomplish a holiness in your life that reflects your walk with God. Now, is it isolated? No, you can take the Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And as you do, I'm going to describe some things in the careful, cautious, conservative nature of the church. The reason often that we don't do things in this church, at least by my influence, and the reason that we do other things is because I want to be careful with the work of God and not make the church simply what I want it to be. My goal, folks, is not to make everybody comfortable. My goal is to lift up Jesus and you follow him. But when we lift up Jesus and we start following him, does he lead us out of a sinful life? Yes. Does he lead us into a life that looks like righteousness? Yes. Does he lead us to doing things that reflect him? Yes. And this doctrine is not only to the individual, but it's to the church. Now, I'm, I'm, before I read 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to argue something here before I get there. It's in Romans chapter 14, and there's a principle found in Romans chapter 14. I'm not going there now, but here's the principle. When you don't know for sure that you should be something, do, be doing something, the principle of scripture is don't. If you're not convinced that you can do that in faith, then don't do it. 
And many Christians operate under the principle, well, I don't say a verse that says I can't do that. I don't see a verse that doesn't say I can do that or I should do this or I should do that. And I just want to say, be sensitive to the Spirit, follow the Lord, be in His Word, let Him guide you. But when He does, we don't just step out and do what we want to do because, hey, there must not be anything wrong with it. Is Satan a liar? Is he sneaky? Do you know what he's going to use to try to draw you from Christ? You know what he's going to use? He's going to use what you like. He's going to try to draw you away with the enticements of the flesh. Now, I don't think that that means that we should go through life and not do things that are fun. Matter of fact, tonight, I hope to show you some things we did in Florida that were fun. Amen. But we need to be checking everything we do by Jesus and a love for him. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, would you read that out loud with me? 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13, reading with me. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And all God's people said. So what, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be established, grounded in Jesus, grounded in him. He's the director of my life. He's the navigator of my life. He's telling me what I should, what I shouldn't do. He's, he's influencing my life, permeating my life until Jesus comes for us or we go to him. But the idea in this passage, establishing our hearts unblameable in holiness before God. So the argument here is that God has called his children to be holy. I'm going to read another passage for you. Well, since you're so close. Uh, go ahead and go to chapter 4, verse 7, same book. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 7. First Thessalonians 4, 7. For God hath not called us unto what? Uncleanness, but unto what? Holiness. holiness. So who's supposed to be holy in the world? Wasn't a trick question. Who's supposed to be holy in the world? Who's so supposed to be separated unto him? Christians, his followers, his disciples. We don't do simply what the rest of the world is doing because everyone's doing it. We do what we do out of a heart that follows Jesus. You know this passage really well. 1 Peter 1, if you'll go there. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Then we're going to go to Titus chapter 2, and time ticks away. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which is, you know these two verses are probably more famously, but he which has called you is holy, so you be holy in all manner of what? Conversation means what? It means lifestyle, it means behavior, it means the way in which you order the living of your life. Because it is written, a quote from Leviticus 11.44, Leviticus 19.2, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Our God is a holy God. And he is worthy of our adoration. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our selling out for him in every jot, in every tittle, in every aspect of our lives. He's worthy of being God of your life. But not only in that worthiness does he call you to be grateful, but in that life, he simply causes you to reflect who he is. So I'm going to come to this now in this passage. I studied this passage first when I was in either Bible college or seminary when I had to do a study on the holiness of God. I'm going to break it down very simply. And here's what holiness is in the life of a believer. It is simply the reflection of the character of God. It's simply a reflection of the character of God. So I'm going to take a time out here for illustration's sake. 
and say that a uh, long story behind this, but I had not seen my paternal father from when I was five to somewhere, I think, where I was 21, if, I, if I, my history serves me right. But then when I was 21, my dad reached out and said, hey, uh, I'd like to see you. So I went to see him. Now, I have a half-brother who doesn't look like me. My half-brother, his name is Ben. He, at 13, was 6'4", 300 pounds. So, big Ben, right? That's Ben. But when I went to see my dad, I, I had seen it in, really in a long time. I remember walking into my grandparents' house, and it was a walk-in basement, had a big living area, had stairs on the left, where you walk up those stairs and you walk into a family room where there are couches. Now, at the top of those stairs, the door was open. So I walked into the basement, and when I walked in, I started walking towards those stairs. I still remember the red carpet and fireplace and all that stuff, the smell of grandparents' house. I walked in, and I, as I walked in, I looked to the stairs, and I looked at the top of the stairs, and right there past the door was a couch where Ben was seated, who I had never met. But Ben, seated there, looks down the stairs, and immediately when he looked down the stairs, he got a look on his face. He looked down the stairs, and almost kind of a look of shock, and then he jetted his head back this way and looked back down and jetted his head back this way. And I didn't know really what was wrong with me. Still don't. <laughs> but when I walked into the room, I saw my dad for the first time in many years. Um, there was no wonder why Ben looked that way. My dad's two inches taller than me. But if you want to know what I'm going to look like, all you have to do is look 20 years further into the future and just look at my dad. And I look a lot like him. Only some of you will appreciate this. The difference between his high school senior picture and mine is that his hair was greased back. Remember that generation? All right. Now, that story is only given to tell you this. I cannot help but look like my family. It's genetics. And some of you are that way. I mean, I don't get it, but you'll look at a baby and you'll say, oh, I see mom and I see dad and I say, I see a baby. <laughs> but some of you can see that immediately. Why? They bear what? The family image. That's what holiness is. It's bearing the family image of Jesus. Now, Who's supposed to do this? Well, there are two answers to that, but I want to encourage you here. First of all, God sees you again as already positionally holy. Again, hagios, it's on your life. You've got the stamp of the family on your life. But are we to join in that? Well, the answer to that is yes. But I want to caution you about this. While it is something you need to know, and think about and examine in your life. I don't want to so hyper inflate this in your mind that you then come to a place of angst and worry of am I, am I, am I? Trust the Lord who saved you to shape you. He will do it. He's going to complete that work in you. And to complete that work, you don't need to hyper stress this walk with Jesus he'll work it out if there's something in your life that doesn't look like him do you think he's going to tell you hello yes and how's he going to tell you through his spirit and through his word so don't stress it just surrender to him and as he shows you what needs to be changed just remember that God's not taking good things away from you. He loves you and is protecting you, but he's really more, I would say really what he's more doing is fashioning you to look like Jesus. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live 
soberly righteous and godly in this present world. Second, this is Titus 2 verse 13 now. We're to live this way, but look, we got hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise God, he's coming. You want motivation for this? Who gave himself for us, that he might buy us back, redeem us from all, how much iniquity? All of it. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, and we know each other, and we know we are that. A peculiar people, zealous of good works, These things, folks, speak, exhort, rebuke. With all authority, let no man despise thee. And it's time that we as Christians stop hiding from separation and hiding from holiness as if when you live it, you hate the world. You do not. You love Jesus. Last passage, Romans 6. Fifteen through twenty three, what then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law but under grace, God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Having been redeemed, who do you want to serve? What master do you want in your life? There is no better no, there is no better Lord than the Lord of the Bible. There's no better king than the King Jesus. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine. The form of what? There's a word. The form of doctrine. Doctrine's a good thing, folks. That form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free, verse 18, from sin, you became the servants of righteousness, praise God. Not by our power, by the way, not by our strength, by the way, but by the reflection of his character and his goodness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh in verse 19. For as ye have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now make this decision. Even so now yield your members, what? Servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now what? That's what happens when you live after the flesh. Now, I don't mean, I don't mean to make a, somebody, you, I'm looking to you viscerally right now, correct me if I got it wrong. You with me? I don't want to give misinformation here. I was told that uh, professional football player Tom Brady uh, was recently divorced, choosing football over his family. Is, is, do I have that right? And, and this, and by the way, my, my compassion goes to him and, and whether or not uh, that's exactly true of him, this choice has been made over and over again. Lifting up something, thinking that thing is going to give you happiness. Now, let's suppose for a moment that I have the story right on that situation. There's going to come a day where you're not going to throw a football anymore. There's going to come a day where you're not going to step on a football field anymore. And what a worthless thing to give your life for. I'll remind you of Ben Peterson, Olympic gold medalist, medalist, gets a gold medal around his neck. And when he gets a gold medal around his neck, after years and years and years of practice, what did he say? Is that it? The greatest motivation for what we do in living this life is a relationship with Jesus. And that we are going to him someday. Your trophies aren't going to matter. They're going to burn. My antlers may get buried with me, but they're not going to go. (laughs) Now you know the plan. (laughs) This life is vanity without Christ. This life stinks without Jesus. I don't care what kind of car you drive, I don't care what kind of house you live in, how much money you got on the bottom line, we've got to have Jesus. And we've got to strive for him, follow him. And when we do, he changes us. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. 
but now being made freed from sin and become servants to God, you have fruit unto holiness. Who made that fruit? God. Who made that fruit happen in your life? Jesus. Who's continuing to make that happen in your life? John 14, 8. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.